Hello, Cruel Cruel World. My name is Dr. Shaham Das. I'm a consultant forensic psychiatrist. I assess mentally disordered offenders for a living so that you don't have to. You can call me the ominous Shahamness. Toxic masculinity. So men, unless you're the type who wears sandals with socks, then that buzzword probably strikes fear into your testosterone pumping cast iron heart. So this video that you're watching will debunk five myths about to toxic masculinity. I'm gonna give you some stats about this issue. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'll give you the actual definition of what toxic masculinity is and what it isn't. And I'll answer the question, can toxic masculinity ever be funny? And of course, we'll have some awkward dad jokes along the way. And as a bonus, I'm gonna tell you about a specific example that's kind of environment where I worked in, in my role uh, assessing and rehabilitating mentally ill people who've committed severe violence and how toxic masculinity really played a massive part in the dynamics of that particular environment. Okay, so let's get straight into it. What is toxic masculinity? I mean, it's simple, isn't it? Toxic masculinity is about bottling up emotions, grunting instead of talking, and solving every problem with a whoosh, roundhouse kick. Not really. Toxic masculinity is a warped, twisted version of traditional masculinity. So there's nothing wrong with being a man. I used to be one myself. But toxic masculinity is, is basically kind of extracting the negative aspects associated and exaggerating certain facets of the masculine stereotype. So obviously there are positive aspects of manliness such as chivalry and protecting your family and we can see these as Mr Miyagi but the negative aspects, toxic masculinity, is John Kreese. But what actually does it all mean? Before we get into the myths I'm going to tell you the four pillars of toxic masculinity and then I'm going to give you a brief explanation of each one. So if I'm, I'm going to list them all first, there is suppressing emotions, aggression and dominance, <sighs> discouraging help seeking, and also homophobia and sexism. I don't know how to mind that without getting canceled. So let's get into each one in a bit more detail. Number one pillar of toxic masculinity is suppressing emotions. So men are expected to be stoic and to avoid showing vulnerability. I wasn't crying at the end of mine, I just had something in both eyes. Number two facet of toxic masculinity is that strength is defined by aggression and dominance, leading to issues like anger management problems. So basically, it's where an individual is pressurized to conform to the tough guy act, and it's unemotional in its image, even if it's, and it's also inauthentic. Like that time you bought nunchucks and ninja stars on your parents' credit card when you were 12 years old. Number three pillar of toxic masculinity is homophobia and sexism. So traditional masculinity can be linked to prejudice against femininity and homosexuality. And in fact, on that topic, it was a philosopher, I think it was Socrates that said, homophobic, nah, you're just heterophobic, staring at my jeans, watching my genitals bulging. That's my mother flipping balls, you better let go of them. They belong in my scrotum, you'll never get hold of them. Number four ingredient of toxic masculinity is discouraging help seeking. So men might avoid asking questions because, or asking for help because it's seen as weak. So I'm not just talking about therapy, I'm talking about this in all aspects of men's life. So as we all know, most manly men would never ask for directions to la piscine or la boulangerie. Okay, enough foreplay, let's get into the myths. Myth number one about toxic masculinity is that it only hurts the victim. So as I said before, there's a level of violence that's associated with this thought pattern. The emphasis on aggression can contribute to this and also to risky behavior, you know, like Biff from Back to the Future. But it can actually also be psychologically damaging to the perpetrator. How? Number one reason that toxic masculinity hurts men is mental health issues. So bottling up emotions can lead to depression, it can lead to anxiety and also substance misuse. Speaking of which, on that topic, before we move on, I have a question for you, Site for Saw guys, which is what proportion of referrals to the NHS, the NUH, talking therapies are for men? So if we get that proportion, we know how often they seek compared to women. Answers later on in the episode, have a guess, see what you think. Number two bad effect of toxic masculinity on the toxic masculina is limited self-expression. So men are discouraged from exploring their range of full emotions and even interests. 
Number three consequence of toxic masculinity, which is kind of related to that, is strained relationships. So if you have difficulty expressing your emotions, this can lead to damage within your relationships, whether that's with your partners or with your friends or with your family. Moving on, number two myth about toxic masculinity is that it cannot be cured. Now, obviously it's not a disease, but it is a cultural issue rooted in societal expectations and stereotypes. However, we can work kind of together towards dismantling these harmful ideas and promoting healthier forms of masculinity. In fact, I think you could argue that as a society, we're kind of already doing it now compared to say a few decades ago. So if you look at the Me Too movement, if you look at society becoming more woke, even things like transgender rights, these all challenge toxic masculinity. Some in society would argue that we've gone too far and that this next generation of snowflakes. I don't know, what do you think my site for sore guys? Let me know in the Schmammer inspections below. Okay, so I know what you're thinking. Dr. Das, talk is cheap. Put your money where your nose is. How, as a society, can we tackle toxic masculinity? That's a great question. This is how. Number one tactic to, talk, to tackle toxic masculinity is challenging stereotypes. So if we're questioning traditional notions of what it is to be a man, then that is absolutely crucial. And that can be in many different ways. It can be in media, it can be in our personal role models and everyday life. It can even be as simple as conversations. All of these can challenge stereotypes. Number two tactic for challenging toxic masculinity is promoting healthy masculinity. So highlight positive examples where men who are strong, who are confident and who are emotionally expressive can also be decent alternative role models. So yes, we might carry a baby Bjorn and we might take long baths and I might even know some of the words to some S Club 7 bangers, but I'm still a man, kind of. Number three way to tackle toxic masculinity is open communication. So encouraging men to express their emotions openly and seek help whenever they need it. That can create like a more um, supportive environment. And this can be done at home, it can be done at school, it can be done in the workplace. Now when I say that out loud, it's probably obvious to some of my younger viewers, but I'm 45 years old, right? When I was a teenager, hundreds and hundreds of years ago, <clears throat> even admitting publicly that you had mental health issues, let alone, let alone actually speaking about them, even, even just admitting it, would lead you to be hugely judged by other people. You'd be seen as a bit of an outcast, a bit of a weirdo. Whereas nowadays, it's almost like every other podcast, YouTube channel is mentioning mental health in some way or another. So it's a good thing. I'm just saying that times are shifting, I think, and you might not appreciate that if you are not as old as me. Another way of putting that into, into sort of context for me personally is I'm a huge fan of rap battles, shout out Don't Flop, shout out Premier Battles. And I think it's fair to say, even though I love them, they are like almost a paradigm of toxic masculinity, or at least they were about 15 years ago. Almost all jokes were either you're gay or I did things with your mother or your girlfriend. And I'm not talking about ghosting them after several dates. I'm talking about much more unsavory acts. So I know that the zeitgeist has changed where even now, rap battlers are talking about their mental health even in the middle of their raps and just talking about the idea of um, you know e emotional expression and that just wouldn't have happened 10 15 years ago now that statement i just said is true but i also just wanted to say the word zeitgeist my favorite word of all time number four tactic to top to tackle toxic masculinity is education and awareness so raising awareness about the negative impacts of toxic masculinity on men's health on the relationships, on the overall well-being is essential. But in fact, I'd like to think that this is what this, is what this video is doing, because I make these videos to educate and to entertain, also to take over the world, not going great. So all of these efforts in combination hopefully will lead or are leading to a cultural shift where men feel more comfortable expressing themselves fully without being judged on narrow stereotypes. So of course, this wouldn't be curing toxic masculinity as such, but it would be rather creating a more inclusive and healthy definition of masculinity for everybody. Number three myth about toxic masculinity is that it's only prevalent in a minority of men. So I'll give you some statistics in terms of the belief in toxic masculinity. A 2018 YouGov poll found that 61% of British young men, so aged 18 to 24, feel pressured to man up due to damaging stereotypes. And this suggests a kind of a social pressure to conform to rigid male norms. So I'm not saying obviously that all those people will display behaviors of toxic masculinity, I'm not saying that. But I think it's, it's fair to say that they must at least experience the uncomfortable thought patterns behind it or feel the pressure behind it. So as an example, let's look at the popularity of Andrew Tate. 
I've got a whole, uh, I've got a couple of videos about him and his psychology and also why I think he uh, became so popular, not so much nowadays, but when he was at his peak. Go chickity check out that video. Always be plugging. Uh, so men are less likely than women to seek help for mental health problems. In fact, a 2021 STEM4 study found that only 37% of boys and young men would feel comfortable talking to their own families if they're experiencing mental health issues. So think about that. If that is the proportion for people that would that would uh, only seek help from their own family members who they're close to, how are they going to ever sort of admit to vulnerability in a kind of hyper-masculine environment, a group of boys, etc., etc. So this aligns with the idea that men shouldn't show vulnerability, which is one of the pillars of toxic masculinity that I mentioned before, if you were paying attention. Okay, my site for sore guys and gals. I asked you before, what proportion of NHS referrals are for, to are for men do you think? The idea is 36%, according to a study by the University of Wolverhampton. So that means about a third of all referrals, of all people seeking help, for, seeking help for mental health problems are men, two, two thirds are women. Of course, it is complicated because some studies not all suggest that women experience mental health problems more often. Some studies, for example, from the primary groups say that one in five women report experiencing symptoms compared to one in eight men. So it's kind of complicated. There's lots of different factors, men's mental health um, in particular. In fact, it'd be really helpful if there was some sort of video about men's mental health, maybe debunking some of the myths. Oh wait, I already did that shit. Go check out my video on that. Number four myth about toxic masculinity is that it's all about suppressing emotions. Before I get into that, I just want to introduce you to this channel, Schmite for Small Minds. My name is Dr. Shahan Das. Uh, I assess mentally disordered offenders in courts and prisons and psychiatric units. This channel is a smorgasbord of videos related to mental health, uh, to offending, violence, crossover between the two. I talk about my own cases in some previous videos. More recently, I'm doing these myths videos, so I've been debunking things like kidnapping, um, Stockholm Syndrome, uh, men's mental health, as I mentioned, cults, etc. etc. I can't remember what videos I did. Just go check them out. I implore you to like and subscribe. Not only does it help me out immeasurably, but you'll never get a splinter again in your life, guaranteed, even if you're scrubbing cricket bats. Okay, back to the video. Myth number four, toxic masculinity is all about suppressing emotions. It's kind of only about suppressing vulnerability, which is perceived as weak or feminine. So, you know, maybe I like a scented candle. Maybe I also think it's necessary to have eight extra pillows on the bed for no discernible reason, but I'm worried that it might make me look weak and unmanly. So strength is defined by aggression and dominance. So it's about exaggerating those particular traits, not suppressing every trait. Okay, almost there. Come on, let's keep going. You can do it, get you back into it. Myth number five, toxic masculinity is never funny. Now, don't get me wrong, just like Russell Howard, the behavior itself is never funny, especially if you're the victim of bullying or misogyny. But I also think there's been a cultural shift in calling out toxic masculinity. And related to that, the comedy world has caught up by making it the butt of the joke. So nowadays, the villain has often has overt characteristics and beliefs. Sometimes even the hero has that, and then they go on a redemption arc, and by the end of the movie, the hero is challenging his own bigotry, and he appreciates a good manicure. So here are my favorite examples of that. Peacemaker, that series that's on Now TV, surprisingly good. It's got John Cena as Christopher Smith, Peacemaker, and he's a jingoistic mercenary who believes in achieving peace at any cost. Now that statement is true, but I also wanted to use my favorite word of all time, jingoistic. So basically, John Cena's character is a bit of a knob in the beginning, but he's trying to make himself better. Number two example would be 21 Jump Street, 2012. So this buddy cop comedy evolves uh, around two undercover cops who go back to high school. I'm sure you've seen it. It's interesting to me because it contrasts a toxic masculinity with a less manly sort of character. So Jonah Hill's character embodies an insecure, awkward version of masculinity. Channing Tatum plays a stereotypical jock. And then it, they, they kind of go back to their high school days as undercover policemen, so time for them has moved on, but they're, they're seeing what it's like for the new generation. And the, the film uses humor to explore the limitations of these masculine archetypes and the importance of communication and teamwork. My next example would be Thor Ragnarok 2017. So this superhero movie deconstructs the traditional hyper-masculine portrayal of Thor. So he loses his hammer, his long hair, he's forced to confront his insecurities. And this film uses humor to explore the themes of toxic masculinity and the importance of self-acceptance. 
Another example, not a film, but a comedian, Bill Burr, one of my favourite comedians of all time. In fact, I was there at the live recording of Paper Tiger at the Royal Albert Hall. So he often talks about his own crazy, traditional, archaic beliefs, but he kind of makes fun of himself. And what's interesting for me is, is sometimes he gives you a little glimpse of where it all came from, i.e. his own father, who, for all intents and purposes, seems to be quite a toxic male. Okay. Question my sight for sore guys and gals. Can you think of any other decent examples of funny films, etc., etc., that challenge toxic masculinity? Let me know in the comments section below. Okay, it's a little bonus at the end of this episode. I told you before that I was going to explain a specific example of an environment where I've seen toxic masculinity at work. And so, uh, in my role, I assess and rehabilitate mentally disordered offenders. I once worked in a therapeutic community in a median secure unit. So it was very damaged patients. A lot of them came from prison. They had personality disorders and there was definitely a hierarchy on the unit. It wasn't prison, but a lot of the prison culture came through. There was a lot of machoism. Loads of people obviously had a, a history of violence. And the whole point of being there is that you interact with each other and you're forced to reflect on your behavior and your offenses. So there's all these meetings constantly talking about your emotions. And you know, if you choose not to engage, then you stay there indefinitely, you don't get discharged. So there's, I think it's fair to say there's a pressure on some people to cooperate to some degree. So f there's 18 patients on the ward, they were all males. I would broadly myself categorize them into kind of three types. There was those who actually wanted to get better, who were a minority, uh, who actually wanted to you know, challenge their behaviors. They've been through the system, they spent most of their adult lives in and out of prison, um, damaged relationships with families, et cetera, et cetera, been in psychiatric units. They actually wanted to change. As I said, I would honestly say that was a minority. There was uh, most people would, I would say, was would reluctantly kind of engage because they felt the pressure and they felt that if they kind of engaged to a degree, then they would eventually leave and get discharged and blah, blah, blah. And I'd say there was a small minority who just wouldn't engage at all, who were at risk of being sent away. We gave them a few months in case they might open up, but they, they mostly got shifted back to prison. So, you know, it kind of extended their prison stay. So it doesn't, wasn't really wasn't really a good use of time for anybody. Anyway, I'm rambling. So the reason I'm bringing this up is that there was there was just like hyper intense toxic masculinity on the ward. There would be men ganging up on each other. There were already cliques and there were people jumping between cliques and there were definitely victims and perpetrators. So a lot of the men would make fun of the vulnerable. When I say the vulnerable, I mean obviously the physically weak, but not just that, certain types of offense. So just like prison, there was almost this hierarchy where if you had you know, assaulted another man, for example, you were seen as cool. Whereas if you had assaulted a, a woman or a child, or if you had some weird sexual exposure kind of thing, then you were seen as a freak. Um, some men were bullied for being gay. Some were even bullied for not being gay, but being the victim of sexual abuse from another male when they were children. When you think about that, that's just, yeah, crazy, isn't it? So the reason that I'm mentioning all of this is that there was also some sexist behavior towards nurses, towards psychologists, and patients were targeted for being too engaged in their therapy. So if you, were, you would try too hard to get on with the, the doctors and the, and the staff, then you were seen as uh, a bit of a teacher's pet. And because it was, so it's literally all the tenets of toxic masculinity locked in an environment. So they were, they were literally living there 24 hours a day. They couldn't leave just like prison. So it was a hyper masculine men, criminal culture and background. So that is just like, I mean, it's just like, it's almost like looking into a zoo and seeing the intense version of toxic masculinity. So that really sticks with me. Anyway, I'm pretty much finished. To summarize, what do we learn today, kids? We learned that toxic masculinity can be funny, but only if the perpetrator is the butt of the joke. We learned that men seek help far less often than women. Only 36% of referrals to NHS talking therapies are for men. We learned that toxic masculinity can be cured, but it's also a cultural, deep-rooted issue uh, related to societal expectations and stereotypes. But we can work together towards dismantling these harmful ideas. We learned that you know all the words to every S Club 7 song. And we learned that toxic masculinity can lead to mental health issues with the perpetrator, let alone the victims, because bottling up emotions can lead to depression, anxiety, and substance misuse. Okay, that's it. I've rambled on enough. Have a blessed day. Buy my goddamn book and do not forget, I love you.